All right, so we are going to get back into it. So I'm very excited about this presentation, um, specifically around mechanical failures and malfunctions. Um, I've mentioned this before and we'll go through it very quickly again. Um, this is the third of five sessions today, and we'll be conducting a live Q&A at the end of every session. Um, so please feel free to submit your questions in the text box here in the questions uh, tab that you see on your screen, and all questions will be addressed anonymously, uh, time permitting. We'll be sending each of you a completion certificate in a follow-up email next week. And if you have any technical difficulties, please feel free to email us at webinar at origin-and-cause.com. I'd like to introduce our speakers. The first speaker is Vladimir Klistovsky. Um, Vladimir is the manager of our Mississauga office in Ontario. He is the, a contributing author of the Lawyer's Guide to the, to the Forensic Sciences. He is a board member and past national president of the Canadian Association of Fire Investigators. He is the training director of CAFI and assists the Standard Council of Canada, the SCC, as a designated expert in their certifying body and laboratory accreditation programs. His specialties include fire and explosion investigations, commercial and industrial machinery, equipment and buildings, and product quality and product design and production. Next speaker, we have Alexa Grutteni, who works out of our Mississauga office as well. She's a certified fire and explosion investigator and a forensic engineer in training. She has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Waterloo and a master's degree in mechanical and industrial engineering from the University of Toronto. And she has attended and investigated over 100 fire investigations or fire scenes. So I'll pass off the mic to Val to get us going. Okay, thank you, George. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me and uh, welcome all to our national tour. So we're going to try and stay within the national tour theme and that is a small malfunction or failure may result in a catastrophic event. Now in my experience uh, it will usually be a small failure or malfunction that goes unnoticed for some time and then there's a second event that may trigger the catastrophic event. Now, if that previous malfunction had been repaired or attended to, uh, then the resulting later catastrophic event will probably not happen. And this is why it's so hey, important. Yeah, Val, so yeah. sorry to interrupt you. There's a little bit of kind of clicking with the... Uh, okay, with the I guess I'm using my hands too much, so I'll, I'll try and calm my hands now. <laughs> Are you talking with your hands? We can't see your hands. I am. I am. Actually, it's a uh, much clearer. So, um, now okay. That you're... That's perfect. Thank you, Val. Sounds good. Okay. Where was I? So, um, yeah. So, this is why it's so important to conduct preventive maintenance and to repair what appear to be small breakdowns or anomalies that uh, that may prevent such calamities from happening. Now. Many of you may relate that to maintaining maintaining your own car. Now, if you have your car serviced as recommended, you do your oil changes, replace tires, uh, do your regular brake jobs, uh, and you listen to those noises that may point to a bad bearing or early engine failure, then you'll probably prevent that catastrophic failure that may cost you thousands of dollars and sometimes even worse. Now, I'll draw your attention to the first uh, statement in our agenda here. That's a really good statement. Now, most mechanical devices have moving parts, and one would think that, that the, these moving parts will eventually wear out. Now, we don't see a lot of failures, like insurance failures related to wear and tear, which may sound strange, but 
manufacturers will typically anticipate and they'll uh, typically anticipate wear and tear. So they'll design that that mechanical device. They'll, they'll design it to make sure that there's no catastrophic loss at the end of life or as, as a result of breakdown. It, and again, I'll draw you to that proper service and maintenance. If that's performed, typically wear and tear is not usually a factor and, and also reduces these, these catastrophic events from happening. So in this presentation, um, we've, we've got three parts. So we're gonna first discuss common mechanical failures that lead to insurable losses. And that's gonna include, as far as mechanical, that's gonna include friction, loss of lubrication. We're gonna talk about fluid release and ignition, uh, which is mostly in vehicles. Uh, poor design, which will include improper material selection, improper tolerances, and improper assembly, and contamination, which is gonna be foreign materials inside mechanical devices, foreign materials that don't belong inside of mechanical devices. And then we're gonna look at two case studies, one having to do with pressure regulators and contamination, and second case study is gonna be about a boiler failure. So let's start off with our item one. We're gonna first talk about the typical uh, common mechanical failures and what we usually see in the field um, that has resulted in fires or, or catastrophic events. And I'm gonna uh, pass the mic over to Alexa, who's gonna talk about a few of those, and then I'll talk about the last one on the list and then present our first case study. So um, without further ado, um, Alexa, do you, you wanna take, take it away? Thank you. So the first common mechanical failure that we're looking at before our case studies is friction. And the example we're seeing here is a bearing failure. On the left, you know, we have a, a bearing, a wheel bearing that's still functioning and all the rollers are still intact. And on the right, we have a bearing that has failed, resulting in a fire. So a functioning wheel bearing is meant to reduce the friction between moving parts and constrains the motion to only what is desired and designed for in the machine. But bearing failure, which can be caused by foreign materials or corrosion, inadequate lubrication, um, et cetera, um, regardless of what the cause is, when we are examining a bearing that was in a fire, we're looking for excessive wear of the bearing rollers or surfaces uh, because this can be evidence that the bearing failed. Since if the bearing was just in a fire and not the cause of it, we would not see the same type of excessive wear. Um, but a bearing that failed will have this excessive wear that will create an excess of friction and an excess of heat which can then result in a fire. So in this example on the right, all of these rollers in the bearing oh, are no longer present because they've worn away, indicating that there was a bearing failure, whereas again, on the left, they're all still present. And then another example of a friction failure in vehicles is brake drag. So again, on the left, we have brake pads that were attacked by fire, but did not experience brake drag. And then on the right, we have brake pads that did experience a brake drag failure and caused a fire. So when we're talking about brakes, um, they're transferring the kinetic energy of the vehicle to heat again through friction to slow the rotor. So some heat is normal, However, a failure of the brakes can, again, cause an excess of heat, which can cause a fire. Brake drag is when one or more of the brakes doesn't release when you take your foot off the pedal. And this can cause an excess of heat, especially if you don't realize uh, right away that the failure has happened. And so you're applying the accelerator and you keep going and it just keeps heating up until something catches fire from that excess of heat. So this Excess of friction and heat um, will lead to 
the cracking and gouge marks that are evidence of excessive heat. And that's what we see here on this brake pad on the right. And that's what we're looking for to tell the difference between a brake pad that experienced brake drag causing a fire as opposed to a brake pad that was just attacked by fire. And then here we have the brake drums, which show the same sort of wear. Um, so the one on the right did undergo brake drag, and that's how we get this scoring and cracking from that excess of heat. And then on the left is the brake drum that was just exposed to fire and doesn't have that same damage. Another mechanical failure is fluid release. Um, so we have a failure that results in fluid release um, and that can be ignited on a hot surface. And vehicles are a really good example for this because almost every fluid on board a motor vehicle is flammable under the right conditions. So that can be the gasoline or diesel fuel. We have coolant, engine oil, everything listed there. So we have to examine every system when we're looking at a vehicle fire to determine whether any fluid was involved um, in the cause of the fire but we also have to be careful because sometimes it can also be a secondary result of a system being attacked by fire and then a leak and so this photo on the right here is a fire that um, is from the fractured exhaust gas recirculation cooler um, and this resulted in a, a recall because a number of uh, vehicles experienced that. Another mechanical failure that we're looking at is poor design and so for the example of this we're looking at centrifugal pumps. So we have fluid coming in the suction side at low pressure and then here we have the impeller which spins and transfers energy to the fluid, pushing it around the volute and out the discharge side at a higher pressure. So we have this overall pressure difference from the inlet to the outlet, but there's also local pressure differences that we can get within the volute. And it's in that areas where we, if the pressure is low enough anywhere, then we can get this rapid creation and collapse of air bubbles in the fluid. And this is called cavitation, and we really want to avoid this. So when selecting a pump for a system, there's what's called net positive suction head. And this is the pressure head across the pump that is required to prevent cavitation anywhere within the pump. So if cavitation occurs, it can wear away material when the bubbles collapse because they collapse so rapidly. Um, and if that happens on the impeller, then we can see, like in this photo, an example of pitting on the surfaces, um, which wears away on the impeller and reduces the pump life and efficiency. So of course we want to avoid this when we're selecting and designing for the pump to avoid any downtime if the pump fails or the impeller has to be replaced due to that wear. Okay, thank you, Alexa. So um, it's, uh, we're now gonna talk about contamination and pressure regulators. Um, now these are your standard pressure regulators that you may have seen on the sides of buildings or inside buildings. Um, this uh, photograph shows a multi-regulator setup on uh, the side of a commercial or industrial building. Regulators are bigger because there's probably more volume of gas or perhaps a high pressure required in the building. And these photographs show typical meter uh, and regulator setups on the side of a residential property. And I picked these pictures specifically just to show some of the problems you may get with contamination with ice and other materials. Um, so that's the regulator here. In, in this case, you have a meter that's covered in snow 
uh, if that snow continued to fall, maybe melted and then refroze and changed to ice, you can actually get um, the, uh, the vent, the atmospheric vent on the regulator right here, if that gets blocked, you may get adverse operation of the regulator, which will cause an overpressure condition of the gas, natural gas into the house. Now, on this slide here, or in, or in this picture here, we've got a single pressure regulator feeding two gas meters. This gas meter, you can see, it's, it looks like it's get, had some dripping of, of tar on it. Um, maybe a roofer was doing some roof work above, didn't do a proper job in detecting the, the meter and dripped some tar on it. Now, the good thing is, is um, there's no moving parts on the exterior of the of the meter. The regulator is here and it doesn't have any tar on it. But what we do see here is that we've got some uh, icicles, um, probably some dripping water from above, and it seems to be coating the meter and, and part of the regulator here. Now again, if we have that ice build up enough and block that uh, regulator vent, then we could have, again, some adverse conditions inside this building with the uh, overpressurization of the natural gas system. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about regulators because um, uh, it's going to be the uh, subject of our first case study. So I, I really want everybody to understand the operation of a regulator and what happens when uh, things go wrong. So here's a couple of uh, pressure regulators or gas pressure regulators. Uh, this over here is a typical one you might see on the side of a house or a building. It's called a service regulator. Now what the service regulator does is it takes the distribution pressure, the pressure that goes down the, uh, the street of a typical subdivision or, or a light industrial, um, uh, commercial industrial uh, area, and, and the distribution pressures are 40 to 60 PSI. And what the regulator does is it takes that distribution pressure and reduces it down to service pressure. Service pressure is what um, can be admitted to appliances to create heat uh, by burning the gas. So service pressure is inside of a residential property and a lot of commercial properties. Is, it's going to be around 0.25 PSI. Now that's uh, seven inches water column. So when we get below one PSI, uh, gas pressure, we switch to a different unit of measure, and that's the inches of water column. So 0.25 is 7 inches water column, so therefore 1 PSI is 28 inches water column. You'll hear uh, contractors refer to inches of water column when they're working on um, HVAC equipment. Um, now, every appliance inside a building uh, actually maybe I can say every appliance, but uh, the majority of appliance will also have a regulator that's smaller. It's called an appliance regulator right there. And the appliance regulator's job is to take that service pressure inside the building and reduce it further to about three and a half to five inches of water column. Now, just so you can understand, three and a half to five inches water column, if you kind of put your hand up and you blow on it and go, that's about the pressure coming out of that uh, manifold or out of that burner. That's about that, the pressure of the gas. Um, okay, so um, pressure regulators are actually a fantastic mechanical device. And, it, and it, it's a great example of a me mechanical device and, and what can go wrong when a mechanical device goes awry. Now, uh, I've got a couple of... Uh, schematics here. I have a schematic of what it looks like inside a pressure regulator here. Uh, and for the purpose of uh, just showing you how a pressure regulator works. So um, pressure regu regulator uh, references atmospheric pressure through the vent, which will allow the vent to admit air back and forth as the diaphragm moves up and down. Now, the main part of the regulator is the diaphragm that's loaded down by a spring. The spring's adjustable to increase or decrease the output gas pressure. 
and attached to the diaphragm is a plunger. And as the higher gas pressure comes down the line into the regulator, it, it goes into the body of the regulator and that higher gas pressure is gonna have a tendency to push the diaphragm upwards against the spring. And you can see that as it pushes the diaphragm up, it closes the plunger against the opening and it stops the admission of gas through the regulator. Now, as the pressure decreases inside the body of the regulator, the, the spring again pushes that diaphragm open and emits more gas. So the regulator will do this over and over, multiple times a second, and that diaphragm will move up and down. And the net effect or the end effect of that is that it allows gas to flow through, but it, the output gas pressure is gonna be at a lower pressure in reference to the inlet gas pressure. Now, uh, in addition, I, I've, I've got a cutaway of a regulator that, that is an actual regulator, and that, that's actually the subject of our case study. So in this case, you can see that there's a little bit more complexity here. Uh, we have a through pipe. Uh, we've got the inlet of the uh, higher gas pressure into the regulator through an orifice. And we've got this plunger here with a shaft and a uh, little lever mechanism. The lever mechanism is uh, pushed on and pulled on by the action of the uh, diaphragm. And again, you could see as the higher gas pressure comes into the body of the regulator, it pushes that diaphragm up, which through the lever mechanism closes the orifice so it closes the plunger against the orifice. And again, doing that multiple times a second. And um, one function of the regulator too is that you can adjust, finally adjust the output gas pressure by adjusting the compression of the spring onto the diaphragm. You remove this cap and then you use a flat screwdriver to push, uh, push down on the spring, actually uh, just closing this nut down and it results in a, a higher output gas pressure. Okay, and here's uh, that same uh, regulator uh, that I showed in the previous slide over here, taken apart. We can see the main part being the diaphragm. Uh, it's made of rubber, so it's pliable. It, it can operate back and forth. You can see the main spring here on the atmospheric side, and you can see that nut that you can remove and adjust that spring pressure to adjust the output gas pressure out of the regulator. Here's that orifice, and the orifice is plugged by the plunger that's over here. You can see the orifice in here. And here's that lever mechanism that acts against the, the push rod and against the uh, plunger that admits gas and then stops gas through the regulator. Okay, uh, hopefully everybody understands uh, how the regulator works now and uh, how, uh, how wonderful a device that is. Um, and uh, I think everybody here that's probably on will probably have a gas pressure re regulator at their house, whether it be uh, on a propane system or on a natural gas system. Actually, those of you that have an oil furnace may not have a pressure regulator. Okay, so rec uh, you'll recall that the vent of the regulator, if, if it gets plugged with snow or ice or debris, it's not going to work very well. And it may have an effect on the output gas pressure to the appliances that are inside that building. So we received a notice of loss. Um, we had an insured that uh, reported that they were boiling some water on a, on a gas range and suddenly they heard some hissing and, and the flame size increased on the range. Now typical flame size on a gas range on, on a burner on a gas range is you know half an inch to an inch. The insured reported that the flames were about four feet high. So you can imagine that probably got them concerned a little bit. Now at the same time, they heard a loud hissing from the mechanical room. Now the kitchen was in the basement 
and the mechanical room was nearby. So they, they, they heard a hiss in the mechanical room. They thought there was something wrong with the furnace. And, it, and just shortly after that, they smelled gas. Now, they quickly called the gas supplier and the gas supplier told them to open all the windows and to evacuate the house. At the same time, the gas supplier sent the technician. The technician arrived at the property. By the time the technician arrived, there was black smoke coming from the house, from the basement. So the technician didn't go, go inside. He turned the gas off at the gas meter and called 911. Now, this, this is the mechanical room uh, in that building. It, it's in the basement. You can see we've got two water heaters uh, and a furnace. The, the water heaters have this very peculiar burn pattern. And that's very similar on both water heaters. Similarly, the furnace has a kind of a peculiar burn pattern on it where the, uh, where the combination gas control is. Now, these are the combination gas controls on the water heater. Uh, what they do is they, they, when the, when the uh, water heater calls for heat, it turns the gas on. And then once the water is all heated up, it turns the gas off. Now, part of the combination gas control, and that's why it's called the combination control, is that it has a, a appliance regulator inside it, which, which reduces the pressure of that gas. Uh, same, same goes for the furnace. Now, appliance regulators are very sensitive to high gas pressures. Most of them have warnings on them that say that they can be damaged if the gas pressure is any higher than half a PSI. And half a PSI is 14 inches water column. Now, during the course of this loss, we later found out that the gas company actually checked the output gas pressure of the service regulator outside the house and the reading they got was six psi into the house now you'll, you'll recall the normal output of that service regulator is about seven inches which is half psi so that's what the, the reading they got is was 24 times the expected gas pressure and 12 times the allowable gas pressure for these appliance regulators and this is probably why we uh, have these peculiar burn patterns as um, the appliance regulators will get damaged if they get exposed to higher pressure. Uh, typically what gets damaged is the diaphragm. It will either blow a hole through it or it will uh, unseat the diaphragm inside the regulator. Okay, so what did we find? We, uh, we took that service regulator back in our lab uh, we dis disassembled it, and what we found was a sandy soil substance inside the atmospheric side of the regulator. And we found a different but very similar sandy soil substance inside the vent of the regulator. Um, so what would that mean for the operation of this regulator if we had this foreign debris? Let's think about that for a bit. So it, it, it was the first cold day of, of the year with freezing temperatures. And uh, this is the debris we actually found inside. You can see that the debris, it looks kind of wet. It uh, being the first cold day of the year, it probably froze up. So Prior to the first cold day, the even having that foreign debris there, the, these service regulators are pretty robust. Even having that debris there, it, it probably the regulator still probably operated properly. But once that those freezing temperatures hit and that debris froze up, that's that's when we had a problem with the diaphragm right here, with the movement of that diaphragm up and down which would have regulated that output gas pressure. Now, we, we took some lab samples of the debris. Uh, what we got back was aluminum oxide, sand, and uh, bits of concrete and cement. cement. Um, 
initially we weren't sure where that uh, debris came from or how possibly it could have got into the regulator. What we later found out through further study that, um, well, the fire was caused by an overpressure of the natural gas system. Uh, that was kind of obvious uh, from, from the appliances and from examining the appliances. The ignition source was probably from the uh, pilot flame, from the water heater, or from the main burner. Now, the ignition source may have also been through static discharge. Uh, we have found in the past that fugitive natural gas escaping at a certain velocity will cause static buildup on uh, nearby uh, materials, and that static uh, build up will eventually discharge and ignite that gas. So that could have been a potential ignition source as well. Now, what we found outside, and this is actually where where that regulator is located, uh, double meter setup again. You can see that it's, it's really close to the concrete steps, and these concrete steps actually look very peculiarly new. Um, we later found out that the concrete steps were demolished and rebuilt uh, earlier that year by a concrete contractor. And uh, the concrete contractor during demolition and casting the new steps likely didn't do a very good job in protecting protecting the, uh, the meters and, and the regulator with something over top, be it a tarp or a box or, or something. We also found that the, uh, the plastic cap, where you can adjust that spring uh, to increase decreased pressure, which actually opens up the regulator interior, was uh, probably missing. And that was the area that admitted the uh, worn material into the regulator. Um, OK, uh, I'm going to pass the. Uh, Mike to Alexa again, and Alexa is now going to talk to you about a high efficiency boiler failure. Thank you. Yeah, so our second case study is a high efficiency boiler. Oh, there we go. Um, and just some examples of things that we're looking for when there is a boiler involved in a fire. We want to look at whether there is an accumulation of soot in the flue passages that could cause flame rollout. We want to be looking at the vent piping and where the venting is going. We always want to be looking at the clearance around the boilers make sure there's no combustibles that are too close. Um, and then we want to be looking at the installation or setup and make sure that it is compliant with any manufacturer's instructions, same with maintenance and service. And this is just a photo of a large steam boiler that experienced a fire and explosion. But for this case study, The notice of loss uh, was that we had a natural gas heating boiler in the basement of a commercial building. I believe it was a restaurant on the first floor and apartments above. So there was also an external water tank uh, that heats the water for all the tenants. Um, the boiler vented through PVC piping. Um, that hot water tank was heated by the boiler and it was installed beside the boiler. And it had been serviced by an HVAC contractor several days prior to the incident. Um, they had been noticing some flow issues. So the service tech had installed an extra pump. So here are some photos of the boiler and we can note right away that the 
origin of the fire was in the area of the boiler control circuit board. And this fire origin is based on where the most damage was located, where the circuit board was. And this can suggest some kind of failure, possibly being electrical from an overload or component failure. So why are we looking at an electrical failure when we're talking about mechanical failures? Well, the centrifugal pumps, which are the same kind of pumps that I was talking about before, um, have to be run by electric motors. So there's always this overlap of, or not always, but there's often an overlap of electrical and mechanical because just generally um, mechanical parts are moving parts and they often are run by electrical components. So in general, it's hard to have one without the other. So often the failures can overlap. But anyway, we did the site examination and that involved tracing out the electrical circuits between the circuit board and the external components, including the pumps. Um, and we compare this to the installation instructions and the boiler wiring diagram. And there were warnings in the installation manual that pump current maximum was 2.2 amps. Uh, we then checked the pumps that were connected to the boiler and found that two out of the three pumps were rated higher than 2.2 amps. So the two Armstrong pumps, the red ones in the photo, were rated 4.75 amps, which resulted in an overcurrent condition um, that overloaded the circuit board. So this installation was not according to the installation instructions that came with the boiler. So it's a mechanical installation issue that caused an electrical failure. Um, and this is a different kind of failure, but these are also centrifugal pumps. Um, so in this case, a possible solution is that the pumps could have been wired through an external pump relay. External relay controls are common in the HVAC industry. There are multiple pump relay systems like the one on the left here. And there are simpler pump relays as in the middle of the photo. But the theory behind the relay is that the boiler control board would be wired to the relay coil, which takes very little current to activate the contacts, which would then turn on the pumps. So the pumps would be wired externally through the relay contra contacts. Um, that way, the boiler control board would be within the manufacturer's specifications, and but we would still be able to run the pumps that have a higher um, amp. So some takeaways. Um, when you get a failure, when you get a fire, we always want to be asking about recent service work on the system and any service documentation, because um, that's really important background information. Um, and we don't want to assume that we know what started the fire and clean up everything else, because we might lose some of that important context. So a really good example for this boiler is if we just assumed that the boiler started the fire, we can just remove the boiler and fix everything else, and then we'll just give the fire investigators the boiler. We'd be losing the context of what it was connected to and all those pumps. Um, so we don't want to have the contractor clean up the area or move or disassemble anything that may remove that context or evidence of how the failure occurred. Similarly, we don't wanna have an electrician change the status of any breakers or restore power, as that can similarly spoil the scene and reduce our chances of determining the cause.
Awesome, thank you so much, Alexa and Val. Um, so we're opening the floor for questions. Um, there are only a couple questions that have been submitted. So if you do have anything that you'd want to be answered, please uh, submit them now. I will start with the first question. Are there instances you can't tell if the component was attacked by fire versus the cause of a fire? And if so, does that result in an undetermined cause in your reports? Yeah, um, there are such instances, George. Um, and as Alexa pointed out uh, in the last slide, the, the more the fire scene is left untouched and we're allowed or we're able to examine all the uh, components and subcomponents, the more we're able to figure that out. Um, as, as in a lot of fires, we're always looking at, um, we're looking at the fire patterns, we're doing, uh, we're doing uh, wire tracing, arc mapping, and we're always asking us, ourselves that question: Is is this is this damage as a as a result of the fire, or could it be as a cause of the fire? And it's it's by examining those components and the components related to it that we can test our hypotheses. Um, uh, doing the sort of you know, if it was this way, then what what should it look like? Or if it was the other way, what would what would it look like? So we're constantly testing our hypotheses in our head, the hypotheses that we uh, develop uh, in trying to figure out the cause of the fire. Uh, when I say hypotheses, it's the, the, the cause hypotheses. So as a fire investigator and as a failure ana analysis, uh, you're always looking at, uh, at it that way. Great. Okay, uh, next question. Was anyone found at fault for the regulator? Was the contractor negligent or should someone else have flagged the missing cap which allowed the debris to enter? Excellent question. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, on both counts. Um, the uh, regulator cap should have been flagged. Um, and typically the people that should have flagged that is the, the typically the meter readers for the gas company that come around every month and read that meter. Um, in the end, uh, the uh, responsible parties, um, it ended up being uh, two responsible parties uh, and they shared liability and it was the concrete contractor and it was the gas supplier. Great, thank you. Um, is it possible that the boiler would have failed without the addition of the third pump since the original two pumps exceeded the allowable amps? Alexa, did you want me to answer that or did you want to go ahead? Um, it's possible but not guaranteed because generally there's a safety factor on ratings. So we may have never reached something that would have resulted in a fire with just the two, but you, it's hard to know. I don't know if you have anything to add, Val. Yeah, so so the, the failure happened at the control board. The control board has uh, copper traces on it. And those copper traces are rated for a certain current and in, in this case uh, like Alexa said the, the the current rating of those copper traces uh, and the copper traces are the ones that admit the current through them to control the on and off operation of those pumps um, the manufacturer had designated it as 2.2 amps and like Alexa said there is a factor of safety maybe, maybe that trace could have ran three or four amps in this case, the, the one amp, well, sorry, the one pump was 4.75 amps. So I, I, I figure that 
we probably would have had the same failure, but maybe would would have taken longer. Now putting the two pumps on that um, uh, probably caused that failure to happen quicker. So it's all a matter of uh, you know exceeding the current, but also a matter of time. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Alexa and Vladimir. Um, guys, I have their contact information on the screen now. We're going to be taking a half an hour break um, as per the schedule, and we'll be starting the next session um, on the hour. So thank you again, speakers, and uh, everybody enjoy your break. <laughs>